text today is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through the end of the chapter. Now Luke has placed this story from Jesus in a series of parables and explanations about why and what gives him the right to eat with sinners. He's been approached by the religious authorities who are upset that Jesus is is dining and eating and associating with known sinners. In other words, people who are reckless in their living and people who are not keeping up to the ritual laws of the church of that day. And so as one of several stories, he tells this story. See, uh, hear, and imagine where you find yourself in this story. Listen now for the word of God. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed his pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough, and then some to spare, for I here am dying of hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. And while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father's killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you filled the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. May the Lord bless to our hearing and are living this God's holy word. Let us pray. O word, O Lord, open us to the word made flesh in Jesus Christ, 
who speaks in these pages and spoke to the peoples of his time. Make us mindful of the needs of others as we listen for your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. This story is perhaps one of the most famous examples or is the greatest, the story of the greatest waster of all history. The prodigal son, he wasted life. He appears to his father one day and says, Father, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. And I want my inheritance. I am out of here. And after a couple of days, after he decides to leave, he packs everything, walks out the door and slams the door on a home, his family, job security, but most of all, on belonging. He is a waster. That's what the word prodigal means. Waster. One who throws away. He journeys to a Gentile land, which for Jew was unheard of. Jews aren't supposed to go in Gentile lands, and yet he makes his home there. He wastes everything he has. There's no details about his life there, except we know it was wild and crazy. There's no more popular person at a bar than a drunk man with money. And he enjoyed it to the nth degree. But wouldn't you know it, just as he's running out of money, a famine comes to the land. There's no food for anyone. So desperate is he to find something to eat in a strange land where he's not welcomed as a Jew. He finally begs a farmer to do what no Jew should do, which is be even in the same area as a Jew, as a pig, for it was forbidden to touch or be around swine. He found himself well below the bottom of the barrel. He's truly a human being in complete ruin. Everything is gone. One day, though, something happened. When he realizes he's face down in pig slop, and imagines his father's helpers back home in a warm, safe, and dry place. Slaves are even better off than he is. He knows what he'll do. I'll do anything. My life is such a mess. I'll do anything just to have a bed to sleep in. And decides he will go home, throw himself at his father's feet, Confess and say, I'm not worthy to be your son. At least make me a slave, a servant, so I can have a place to stay. He makes his way home. Now, father back home, and I'm sure mother, have been watching every day the ridge along the plain that would, of course, have carried his son home if he had taken the direct route, which he did, of course. And so the father sees the boy one day before the boy ever sees the father. Now in those days, a father was to have great dignity in a family because families were large and he was the patriarch. He was the one who made the decisions. And he would never be caught running toward his children because children were to run to him. But this is no ordinary father. This father, losing his dignity in the joy of the moment, breaks into a run when he spot when he sees this, the boy head drooped, mumbling to himself. The father runs across the field and smothers his son with kisses, a robe, a ring, and calls for the fatted calf. Before the boy has even finished his apology. His explanation, his complete catharsis of, 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 of spilling out his regret. There's no need to hear apologies. 
with this father. Now I can just imagine the neighbors next door and what they might be saying watching this scene. Darlene, look at that. Old Josiah has flipped his wig. Running out to meet that scoundrel of a son. Phew, I can smell him from over here. After running off with his inheritance, he don't have no claim. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't have a place in the family. But look at that old man. Without any dignity at all, he's taking him back just like nothing ever happened. If that was me, I'd tell him, heck, no, you got to wait a while. The servant's my servant before I'll take you back. To take him back, well, that's not fair to Junior, the older boy. The parents got to be fair. No, I wouldn't waste yesterday's roadkill on that rebellious, self centered, egotistical, arrogant little rat. What a waste the feast would be. What a waste. That's what the others are claiming. That's what the older boy claims. You're wasting it on him. So maybe the father is the prodigal here. The one who's wasting this banquet on this scallywag who's come back home. If you surveyed the room today, and I, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but my hunch is if you're like most Presbyterians our age, There's only a few of us who live the life of really reckless abandon. We're pretty subdued types, us Presbyterians. Not many of us have done the kind of sinful living that, when told, keeps people's attentions for hours. Theft, cheating, guns, gang, stealing, drugs, abandoning family, booze, wild parties, breaking the law. These are major league sins, whereas most of us, we play in the minor league. Or really, the local softball circuit. But even though you have sown maybe a few wild oats in your past, you're grateful to be taken back and forgiven and now live a pretty straight life. You and I identify with the older brother in this story, probably. For we understand his position. What has the older son been doing at the end of each day? In short, he's been pulling double duty for his younger brother for weeks, maybe months. And he's exhausted. His boot smell of goat manure, he needs a shower. He spent much of his day obsessing about how his brother's rebellious actions have made his life harder. He hears the commotion going on in the house and he asks a servant what the music is about. The Greek word for music is interesting. It's not just he hears a tune, but he hears a symphonia, the Greek says. He's heard a symphony. He's heard a major production going on in the house. This isn't a couple of people standing around a microwave with a lean cuisine box spinning around. This is a major feast. Your brother's back, the servant yells. Your dad has restored him to the family. We're killing the fatted calf. What a special day. So now tell the truth. If you had been in Junior's shoes, working double shifts, while your stinking little brother had been living it up, throwing everything away, and then you heard that dad was taking him back, would you like that? Probably not. There's something primitive here and basic here that calls for God to be fair. And it's not. And that's what the older boy is doing, sitting on the steps, wondering if he's going to go inside, is wondering, how is this fair to me? There's a lot of theological themes in this story. We don't really know what the son did, whether he went in or stayed out. But then that's kind of the point, isn't it? 
We don't know what he has done. And it leaves it open to beg the question, what kind of attitude do you have and do I have when it comes to the feast? For all of those who are really not worthy to be called Christians, who are not worthy to be called beloved, who God reaches out a hand to and says, you are my beloved. The ones that we wouldn't hang around with, the ones that we discourage from coming to our church. The poor, the lame, those who are different, who aren't proper, who aren't like us. Who really fit into the category of the younger rebellious son. And the older stay at home good guy. The older brother. Today God brings us to this table. This table that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as he brings it to this table. He says come everyone. This is the fatted calf. This is the table set forth for everyone who can come. There's no waiting, there's no pleading, there's no begging to come to this table. Simply a desire to be embraced by the one who would die for us. There's no requirements except that you love God and you want to love God more. There are no requirements except an open and loving heart and a heart that says, I'm not worthy. So come, eat this bread and take this cup as celebration that God loves you. Let us pray. O merciful creator, bread of heaven, spirit of love, we praise your holy name. When the crowds were hungry for miracles, Jesus promised that we who come to him will never be hungry and we believe in him will never be thirsty. In you we find a resting place and a gentle master to receive us. Generous, merciful God at this table, you call us into the heavenly feast, promising to fill us with good things. Bless this ordinary gift of bread and this fruit of the vine that we may be kneaded and pressed into one holy living body. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, O Lord. And make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, the bread of heaven broken to feed a hungry world so that we may become one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. In the name of Christ, who lived and died and rose again. Amen.